Hello and welcome back to John. And today marks a bit of a milestone where this is the 100th <laughs> Bible study that we've had on John. The number 100. Woo! Woo! <laughs> it is. It's really one, number 100. But this is even, even after us, after me, near the beginning, skipping over part of chapter 3. And yet it makes a difference. Like when these readings have come up recently in the service, yes, everything comes flowing back. As it, it does make a difference. It does. I, I, at least I hope it does. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd spend 100 Bible studies doing almost nothing. But. I particularly noticed that with our, the devotion book. Mm. Speaking of them, are they in the portals of prayer? I don't know. Because I don't have the April one. I mean, it starts three months, April, May. Yeah, 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 I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't seen it in the office. Okay, well, anyways. <laughs> so for our hundredth one, I, I think it's fairly suitable that we're getting into one of the best known verses in the Gospel of John, where Jesus Christ is talking about being the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, even when we're talking to people outside the church, sometimes we're getting into this not necessarily referencing the specific verse, but we're saying that, well, Jesus is the truth or he's the way. So if we're, so if we're trying to talk to people who are outside of Christ, sometimes they actually just offhandedly reference this saying, you know, Jesus is the way that we have salvation. But uh, let us get into the text itself so that we know more exactly what Jesus is talking about when he makes that statement. So, uh, can somebody please, oh, uh, sorry, yeah, before we get into that, just, just a short recap. So, we are in the Last Supper discourses in John, so John doesn't really describe the Last Supper itself, and specifically the Lord's Supper, but the Gospel of John is primarily centered around a whole bunch of speeches, so this is towards the beginning of those speeches, and the beginning of the speeches are specifically for the disciples that are asking questions. So we already had a response to St. Peter, but moving from Peter to the entirety of the disciples about uh, where Jesus Christ is going or what, what he's doing when he's leaving. And now Thomas will have uh, an, another question building off of, well, where are you going? So could somebody please read John chapter 14 verses 5 to 7. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Okay. Did that mean that when he said that, that when you've seen me, you've seen my father? Well, we'll, we'll be getting into that and <laughs> all the ontological nuances, the question of being and whatnot. But okay. Jesus is not identifying himself as the father. I'll, I'll give you that spoiler right away. Would you say that again? I didn't Jesus catch that. Jesus is not saying that he is the father. Okay. Yeah, he's not saying that. So uh, first off, Thomas. What do you remember about Thomas? Doubting. Doubting. <laughs> that's, that's usually what everybody remembers. What else? He was a twin. Ooh, yeah, yeah, he's a twin. You know, he was a disciple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's that's primarily what you'll remember from the rest of the gospel. So uh, as is notable with the gospel of John, uh, when, when disciples come up in the gospel of John, usually John's the only one who talks in depth about any of the disciples. So when Thomas comes up in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts, he's just basically mentioned, and that's it. We, we don't have any stories about Thomas except in the Gospel of John. However, I will I will mention that he is called the twin 
in at least one of the other lists. I'd have to look that up uh, to remember which one it is. But he is known as the twin more widely than the Gospel of John, but uh, he's also called the twin in the Gospel of John, but we get a, cu a, a couple extra episodes uh, with him. So the big one everybody knows is the doubting, which will be at the end of the Gospel. Um, this is at right here in chapter 14. This is the second appearance of St. Thomas, and it's for that one verse. He asks that one question, and he's not really mentioned by name again. He's definitely still there. He's still with the other disciples doing whatever the disciples are doing. But this is where he's going to get mentioned. And he's mentioned one time before this. And this is actually something that we've gone through, which I'm sure everybody remembers. I, I know nobody remembers. But in John chapter 11 with the resurrection of Lazarus. So what ends up happening in, in John 11 is Jesus receives word, Lazarus is sick. Jesus intentionally waits behind until Lazarus dies. And then once Lazarus is dead, Jesus says, now I'll go to wake up Lazarus. And the disciples are, well, if he's asleep, he'll wake up again. He'll get better. And, and then Jesus has to go, no, 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 he's dead. He's actually dead. I'm going there to wake him up. And uh, at that point, the disciples, they're a little bit uh, confused because there's, it, because uh, uh, that's in Bethany, which is pretty close to Jerusalem, and it's where there are a whole bunch of people waiting basically to kill Jesus. So they're saying, well, Jesus, if you go there, they'll kill you. And Jesus says, well, I'm going to go anyways. And it's St. Thomas. St. Thomas is the one who says, let us therefore go and die with him. So St. Thomas is very much willing to put his life at risk for the sake of Christ there. Now, with Thomas here, in, in uh, chapter 14, well, we only have one sentence from him, so we don't really know too much. But we do know that John, the author of the gospel, he's going to be kind of hinting at a couple things. So he's looking at, well, Thomas is pointing to Jesus Christ's death with, with Lazarus. Uh, Thomas is going to be looking to the resurrection towards the end. So, so this verse in the middle is kind of uh, Thomas reminding us of Jesus' death and resurrection, or, or, or the focus towards the death and resurrection. But uh, even, even greater than this would be something beyond doubt that, that Thomas is doing and saying. Because everybody remembers Thomas doubting. But what is his response after, after the doubting? Wasn't it my Lord and my God? Yes. Mm -hmm. One of the most emphatic statements of the divinity of Jesus Christ in the entirety of the New Testament. I didn't hear what you said. My Lord and my God. Oh. Yes. And also, as we'll eventually get to chapter 20, where that's current, uh, we'll just discover that we don't have an explicit word that Thomas, because Thomas's request is that I uh, feel the nail marks in his hands and his feet and put my hand into his side with the spear wound. So that's explicitly what St. Thomas says, but we don't have an explicit mention of him actually doing that. He just sees Jesus and then he says this. So we don't know if he actually did that first before actually making that exclamation. So quite possibly Thomas is having one of the greatest statements of faith beyond any of the other disciples. Didn't Jesus say to him, come and see? And, uh, you know, he wanted Thomas to examine him? Yeah, he gives the invitation, but Tom, but we don't have an explicit word that Thomas actually got to that point. It's just assumed by us, I suppose. Yeah. So it, it's difficult to say. And basically, until we get to heaven where we actually ask, hey, did you actually do this before you made that statement? Uh, we're not going to know. But yes, Thomas is having the most, uh, or one of the most, it's definitive statements about Jesus Christ's divinity in the New Testament. So Thomas is being brought up here not because he's doubting, but that he's actually seeing Jesus Christ as God in the flesh, as one with the Father, and seeing that from Christ you have a clear point forward to God himself. So Thomas, even though he's questioning things here, 
he's afterwards showing us, hey, Jesus is the way to God. <laughs> well, nice, nice little hint. Nice little hint. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and before we get to Jesus' statement, any, anything else with Thomas? Do you want to know? Nope. Okay. So now we're going to get to Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. All right. Me, how am I putting up my head? I didn't touch anything. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> All right. So we'll get into Jesus' statement. So I am. And we'll have the way, the truth. We'll have the life there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, no, I gave you a little bit of a hint already with. Putting, putting this in all caps. But what is Jesus Christ saying there with the I am? It's God. Yes, he's, he's proclaiming his divinity because he is referencing the divine name, which if we're looking towards the Hebrew uh, Yahweh, which is Kind of the, the he is, or if, if you're speaking from your first person subjective point of view, where Jesus Christ is, he's, he's not just going to say he is, which is more of the proper form for Yahweh, because if you're saying, oops, there we go, <laughs> that's right now. Uh, if, 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 if everybody keeps saying I am, they're, they're also claiming to be God. So the, the proper form is actually the he is. So when Jesus Christ is saying this from his subjective point of view, he's saying, I am, funny, funny divinity there. And this is, of course, also the emphatic use of the words in the Greek, which you can't see in the English translations, quite unfortunately. But in Greek, the verb indicates the subject, the person the subject. So depending on what form the verb is, it's implied if it's uh, the second person, third person, first person, or if it's uh, singular or plural. We don't have that in English. Uh, we, we have some hints in English. Because if, if, if I say something about, oh, gives. So who gives? I'm, a, I'm asking, like, who gives? Who, who uses the plural form of the so if I say who gives, is, is the person, is there one person giving or multiple people giving? One. Multiple. Yeah, one. Mm -hmm. So it's he, she, I, or, or yeah, yeah, he, she gives. When it goes back to the I give, then, then it goes under here. But if we're looking at uh, give, well then, who give? I know that sounds very awkward, but who give? First person. Yeah, so we have I or they give. So it's, it's either first person or first person singular, third person plural. Or, or you could also have in there you give, which, which is also same for singular and plural. So we do have a hint of this in English. But we don't have it nearly to the degree that uh, Greek has this. So, so we have two forms of this verb, more or less. Like we, we can parse this out even with uh, participles and other things where you say giving or something like that. But in general, for something like this, and this is what's called the indicative movie, we have two forms. 
If we go to Greek, there are six. And those six will have first person, second person, and third person. And then you have uh, singular or plural. So two times three is six. So you have, so you have three. So how do you distinguish between him saying, I am, in, in referencing God, or <laughs> I am the way, as in, <laughs> rather than... Yeah, so, so this is him using it, grammar is fine, but what's called transitively. So is this taking an object? So we have a number of different I am statements from Jesus throughout the Gospel of John. There are seven I am statements, this being number six, of Jesus saying, I am something. Whereas there's also a whole bunch of I am statements in John where Jesus is just saying, I am. And at times that even makes the grammar awkward because he's just saying, I am. Um, for those of you who are listening to me on Good Friday, there was a portion in John chapter 18 where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Judas is leading a band to try and capture Jesus. And they go, and Jesus asks them, who are you seeking? They say, Jesus of Nazareth. And the, the text, if you're following along in the bulletin, says, I am he. But the word he is not in the Greek. It's not. Which makes it very awkward for English because it kind of go like, yeah, well, he's confirming his identity. But really what Jesus Christ is saying is, I am. At which point they all fall to the ground. Ah. Do exactly what Jesus Christ is actually saying. Um, and then they have to get up, and then the, and Jesus asks them again, "Who are you seeking?" And then they go, "Jesus of Nazareth." And he goes, "I told you, I am." Uh, and yeah, so 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 they are feeling the effects of the divine name at that time. Uh, much like in John chapter 8, uh, verse 58, where, where Jesus is making the claim before Abraham was, I am, and then, then Jews picked up stones to stone him, so they knew what he was trying to say. So, so for this, it's kind of the difference between transitive and intransitive verbs, where is, is this taking an object? So right now, when Jesus is saying, I am, and he's taking an object, well, he's making a lot of uh, divine truths with the way if this marker works. Divine truths with the way, truth, and the life. That's what we'll be getting into. But right now, we know that uh, Jesus is signaling this, or at least John the Gospel writer is trying to say he's signaling this, where we have the emphatic use of the um, uh, singular pronoun from the I. Because, yeah, as I was saying, the verb doesn't need it. So most of the time you see a verb for the for am, it doesn't have a subject. But unless the person's trying to really amp themselves up, then they'll they won't be the I. But Jesus is using the I here to make divine statements. So when he said I am, and they all fell to the ground, mm -hmm. was that their individual response? or was that some kind of supernatural um, That's effect? supernatural. I would think so. If, if you're getting a whole bunch of people who are trying to capture and kill you, yeah. the, their, your initial response isn't, oh, I'm going to be worshipping this guy. Okay. No, right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. The difference isn't apparent in the Greek, but not in the not, not very much in English. Yeah. It's more apparent in Greek. But it's also contextualized by the gospel of John itself because John is using his words very purposely. So it, it purposefully. So if we're looking at uh, different I am statements from Jesus where you have the uncharacteristic for the Greek use of the I there. Well, what is Jesus Christ saying? And the, the seven I am statements are all Jesus making very emphatic statements about. Uh, who he is in divine <laughs> hmm. If he's saying, I am the bread of life which has come down from heaven, and if you eat my body, drink my blood, 
and you will have everlasting life. That, that's pretty important. Is, is the Greek of today the same as it was when the Bible was written? I was thinking no, no, the Greeks is, should have an advantage, but then they don't if they don't. That they do, but it's very old Greek. So it'd be kind of like us trying to understand um, English in, I'll say, 11th, 12th century. So it'd be pretty difficult for us to try and understand that. And specifically for us, our difficulty would also be in terms of spelling. Because that was around when there was a major shift in vowels in English. So things weren't quite the same. <laughs> Stupid inclusion of French changing the Germanic vowel system. But anyways, once you get to, to Chaucer in the 13th century, then English starts to make a little bit more sense, but it's very much pronounced differently. There's no standardized spelling, so it's still be difficult, relatively difficult for us to understand if we're just trying to read Chaucer as he was originally written. Um, but for Greek speakers, this would be a fairly old form of the Greek. So they're not really used to it. So there's going to be word meanings that aren't up to date. Because if, and, and this is the example that most people give, but if, if I use the word gay today, it's not going to have nearly the same meaning as it did in the child center. Or if I use the word guy, well, that didn't really exist in the 12th century because that got popularized uh, after the kind of gunpowder plot much, much later on. And usually it was originally a pejorative term. So it also shifted away from that. But with the original Greek, yeah, it's, it's very much different. So this is what's called Koine Greek. And that's the quite literally common Greek. Koine is common. Uh, same thing with koinia, fellowship, having things in common. So the common Greek was spread throughout the different um, places that had been uh, at least nominally taken over by Alexander the Great. And of course it shifts here and there. So biblical Greek is slightly different from, um, I guess you could say Alexandrian Greek in a couple centuries earlier because there's this very notable Jewish philosopher named Philo who lived in Egypt. It, even his Greek is slightly different from what you find in, in uh, the New Testament. Slightly different, not much, but slightly different. That also has to do with um, uh, dialogues. My diverse. Anyways, so you, so you have to go from, uh, let's see if I remember this correctly. Lyric Greek, Classical Greek specifically with Attic Greek, then you get to something closer to Koine, then from Koine you start getting more into medieval types of Greek, and then there's something else going on there, you're after the fall of Constantinople, and then you get to more, more modern uh, senses of Greek. So, so today's Greek is different from what the past had. Also mentioned there's also different variations on Greek. So technically Coptic. Mm. But yeah, yeah, okay, so Coptic is is a language that was spoken in Egypt. So it's it's related, oh actually technically it still is because Coptic Christians still use it for their church services. Um, but Coptic is actually a derivation of Greek, but it's not identical with biblical Greek. So, but, so Copts can sort of read the original New Testament, but it's still going to be different enough that they'll have to maybe use a dictionary every now and then. Language fun. So, so I'm going to guess, is that horse sufficiently beaten to death? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I could go on more about languages, but anyways, um, so we have the I am. So Jesus is right away declaring divinity. And this is going to be the okay. Okay. This person. Okay, six out of seven 
I am statement. I am statement. Um, do you remember the other ones? That's fine. All right, I already mentioned one. Door. Door. The checker. The shepherd. Vine. Bread, bread of life. The vine is one that's coming. But yes, that's one of the seven. No. no. He will give living water. Okay, but he, yeah. He is not the living okay. water. Living water refers a little bit more towards the, the Holy Spirit. Um, resurrection and the life. And let's, let's, which one happened to be done there? Um, oh, uh, we also have the truth and life, and then I am the light of the world. And with almost all of these, he mentioned, he says it twice. I don't know why, but with almost all of these, he says it twice. This is one of the two that he doesn't. But he only says it once. The only, the only other, the one that he does, he only says it um, one or two. Oh, I didn't write it down in my notes. Now I'm, now I'm questioning myself whether he said I'm the door twice. I do know he said, I do know that he didn't say um, one of them twice. Yes. So it so it is uh, I am the door. I am the door is the only other one he only says once. But uh, this I am statement is unique because this is the only one that has that's uh tried that's tried. I mean, we have three times. The closest one that we've had before this is resurrection and blood. But this is the only one where we actually have uh, three individual items. And you could also argue that maybe it isn't three individual items. Maybe it could be all united into one individual concept. But it does seem to be more triune because just glancing at the original Greek, we have the definite articles. Why is that important? Oh, more grammar. Yay, more grammar. So for Greek, much like in English, you don't need a definite article. For us, the definite article is the. So we only have one definite article in English. Want to take a stab at how many there are in Greek? Six. <laughs> Got six. <laughs> Do I hear some? Do I hear? Yeah, so there's um, three main uh, types of, of nouns masculine, feminine, and then you have neuter, so neutral. And then you have four cases, nominative, dative, accusative, and genitive. So you sort of have 12, but some of them are identical to each other. So depending on how you want to count it, they're around 12, sure. Yeah, let's go with 12. So definite article is also a big, big thing in, in Greek. Um, and when you don't have a definite article, it's just kind of using the generic, well, this is a concept that you throw out there. So for us, at the indefinite article is the word a ah, or an. So, we will, so instead of having the dog, where you're referring to something definite, it's a dog. It could be any dog. Same sort of thing that's happening in Greek. You have the definite article, which is saying this particular thing in particular, versus uh, indefinite, where you could have general. But since we're also in a list, uh, you can have just the first one being definite, and then it, and then it would carry over to the rest of the list. Because if you say Jesus is the way and truth and life, well, that would still make sense in the Greek, but that would assume that they're all one item. If you're having a definite article for all these things, Jesus is claiming basically three different things for himself all at the same time. So, so we know that each one of these is holding its own weight. They're not identical. They're not interchangeable. 
they're they're very much definite. It is the way, this particular way. It is this particular truth. It is this particular life. So yes, uh, with the I am statement, where Jesus is saying I am with the Father, and He's using three individual list items, all with the definite article. It seems to be foreshadowing the Trinity. And Jesus is also using this concept to say that, yes, I am one with the Father. And then he brings up the Holy Spirit later on in the speech. So it seems that this is Jesus saying this is also trying to introduce the entirety of the Trinity. And even though we might not ourselves have direct access to say, like, Father, which is which is going to be Philip's question later on. Uh, or show us the Father. Well, Jesus is saying, well, fine, the, you see me, you've seen the Father, because I'm the way, the truth, and life. He's the way that you can actually come to the Father. And same thing with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the way by which we receive the Holy Spirit. But that gets far, far, far more complicated when we get into the practical, the, the practical aspect of things. I have an idea. Oh. <laughs> So do each of those reference one passage? No, no, this, this is all we need to Jesus. But he is basically showing that he's the in-between of out of all these things. So he's the way to get to the Father, but he's also the way to get to the Holy Spirit. And as Jesus will bring up later on, when he's giving you the Holy Spirit, he's giving you the spirit of truth. And the spirit of truth will lead the disciples into all truth, as Jesus Christ would say. But this is basically more of a reciprocal relationship between Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus gives the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit brings people to Jesus. And God and Christ points them to the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit points us to Jesus, and, and so on and so forth. So it, it's a far more complicated relationship with the Holy Spirit in, in, the, in the practical effects of things. Uh, especially when we consider, well, how do we come to faith? By way of the Holy Spirit, calling and enlightening us through God's Word and through well, Holy Baptism. And why can we have, or why does the Holy Spirit go into the Word? Well, it's because it's the Word of Christ, it's the Word of Truth. And how, and what does the Holy Spirit baptize us with? Well, it's the blood of Christ that He baptizes us with. So, so the Holy Spirit and Jesus seem to be always kind of working in tandem together in terms of bringing us to faith and enlightening us in faith. Uh, but Jesus is, is the way that, uh, that we properly come to the Father, and the Holy Spirit will bring us to Christ to bring us to the Father. So it's always going to be through Christ as, as the one who's connecting us. So he, he is very much the visible aspect of God for us. Sense. Good to know because I was looking at that and going, I don't know which is the father and which is yeah. the father. I can't quite no. that one out. <laughs> the father is the way to himself. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah, this is all Jesus. You say when you said baptism I, and you said it was the blood of Christ, that's I, I never really connected that, but I, I, I get it. Yeah. Yeah, because we uh, always talk about baptism being washing. And... Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and uh, this this is where you, you probably have not remembered it, but I have brought this up, I think, like two years ago when we were talking about John Shepard's tree. <laughs> so, of course, of course, everybody remembers that. Uh, but in John chapter 3, where Jesus is speaking about um, kind of, kind of the, the washing there, or 3 and 4, I should say, 3 and 4. But Jesus is talking about washing living water and things of that sort. Um, in, in connection with baptism, we're, we're trying to think, well, how do we actually see baptism in relation to John? And John doesn't really have a lot of statements about baptism. He has going on in the background, but he doesn't really talk about baptism, much like he has inscriptions of the Holy, Holy Supper in his gospel, but he doesn't really talk about the Holy Supper. John and mysticism, I tell him. Anyways, so one of the things that John will most emphatically tie his witness to in the entirety of his gospel 
It will be the crucifixion, but specifically, specifically the blood and water pouring forth from Christ's side. That is the thing that he's putting a lot of emphasis on. And it's also going to be connected thematically as well as uh, structurally in the gospel to the wedding feast of Cana, where Jesus Christ is turning water to wine. So we have something remembering blood, also connecting us to both sacraments, water uh, and, and, uh, and wine itself, baptism, Lord's Supper. And when we try to tie this together, well, it's difficult because, again, John's being very mystical. It's not really showing us this is exactly what I mean in terms of baptism. But if we if we do look to where he talks so at least a little bit about this in uh, his letter, 1 John chapter 5, specifically verse 6, he's saying um, these three testify, so witness Christ to us. And it's going to be uh, uh, the Holy Spirit the water and the blood. Not the water alone, but the water with the blood. Water does not appear without the blood. So when you think about, well, if we have absolute certainty of where the water is, absolute certainty where the Holy Spirit is, and we know that this is baptism, well, then there's an absolute certainty that Christ's blood is there as well. To what degree? Hard to say, again, because this is very mystical. But uh, we do know that uh, the power of Christ's blood, the power of salvation, is in baptism itself. Uh, oh, I also mentioned quite briefly, uh, the book of Hebrews has also has kind of a passing mention of this in, in uh, chapter 10, verses 19 to 22, where uh, the author of Hebrews is saying, uh, since we have uh, consciences sprinkled clean, and he doesn't use the word blood there, but when you sprinkle something in relation to sacrifice, which is what he's talking about there, uh, that's specifically blood. So when you have your consciences sprinkled clean and your body washed with pure water, we can come into uh, the, the holy of holy places with the Father. So if you're thinking, well, sprinkled clean internally with an outward through washing, again, that is... So there is the blood of Christ that Christ is working in baptism, but, but we have to do a little bit of, of work to hammer out the specific doctrine. All right. Uh, any other? All right. So let's start getting into this. Now we have the way. This is this is hard actually because the actual word for way, uh, uh it, it, it comes up not infrequently in the New Testament, but this is practically the only place it occurs in the Gospel of John. Only place, oh, chapter here, chapter 14, with the exception of one use in chapter one with a quotation of the Old Testament, uh, referring to John the Baptist, that he is the one preparing the way of the Lord, uh, the voice is the one crying out in the wilderness. That, that's the only, only mention of the way. So you could say, well, maybe this has a connection <laughs> to that, and that, that's a reasonable assumption to make. But if we're trying to figure this out a little bit more, trying to figure out specifically what's going on here, we have to do a little bit more digging. And, uh, in, in John's other works, the, the word way comes up twice in Revelation. Neither of them are useful. John, you failed me. No, he hasn't failed. But uh, this just basically means that we have to be a, a bit more inferential in how we understand this word rather than just looking for different uh, pieces of evidence across the gospel. So one, one of the better ways to help us out with understanding this would be different usages in the book of Acts. And I'll reference, for example, chapter 9, verse 2, uh, 19 and 23, and there's a whole bunch of different uh, verses that this appears. But uh, in, in those passages, 
the way equals the Christian faith. Because people, because uh, basically when it comes up, it's uh, so and so gave instruction in the way, or uh, they had to go away from this and follow the way. So it, it's spe specifically more for the Christian faith as a whole, in, in the book of Acts, anyways. But we could also go into the Old Testament. So if you look for the word path or I guess or even road if you will um, the prose form of it is direct I'm forgetting the poetical form for the word for way which is bad because I probably need to know this for my Hebrew final in two weeks <laughs> we'll find out okay uh, but, but you have a whole bunch of references to the way in, in the Old Testament, and usually this is more in terms of the figurative understanding of it in, in relation to faith. So the way is the way of righteousness, you could say, or the way of destruction. And it's always going to be the exact same path, but you're just heading in different directions on the same path. So you're either on the way to God or you're away from God. Um, I don't know if you recall, but I kind of gave a sermon on this a few weeks ago where I was talking about, well, um, you have faith and repentance, and this is guiding you on the path so you can go one way or if you go the other way. And if you repent, you're turning away from the way of sin and you're going to the correct path. So, yeah, that, that's basically an Old Testament uh, illustration of what you're supposed to be doing. So Jesus Christ is saying he's away. I'm going to, I'm going to think that this is most likely deriving from the Old Testament passages, which are saying that, yeah, this is the way of righteousness. This is the way of the faith that we're coming further and further and further along in repentance uh, unto our Lord. So Jesus is the way by bringing us actually to the Father and his righteousness. So not just a um, passageway to heaven, if you will, but this is also sanctification, making us holy. I'm also going to put sanctification there. Because if you're thinking about, well, how... how there we go. Because we're thinking, well, how do we actually get to the Father? Well, it, it's Christ making us holy that we may actually enter into the presence of God. So th this is this is not just a path that we follow, but this is a transformation that's going about. So if uh, Jesus is the, the I am, the way, the truth, and the life, who's actually bringing us to the Father, uh, this will be also through means like the Word and the sacraments. What we were talking about just a moment ago. We're, if we're coming into the faith, if we're coming into Christ, well, this is also the process of being whole. Questions, comments about that? Okay. So I'll. I'll... Oh, a Pastor, yeah. that term, that term, the way, is yeah. basically the only way. Yeah, so that, that was what I was about to get in there. So if we're, if we're looking at the definite article, the way, and Jesus is the way to the Father, so there aren't other ways. There are. No. Um, one and one. And, and this is this is what people will take issue with us as we start speaking in the public square, because mm -hmm. we're going to be making well what what uh, is taught is usually described in philosophical fields as mutually exclusive truth claims. Mutually exclusive truth claims. <clears throat> so, uh, an example of this would be black and white. So something's so. If you're saying something that's white, it can't be black. If you're saying it's black, it can't be white. And if you go out into the public square and say something like uh, a black and white statement, people are like, oh, no, how dare you say that? Can't you see the infinite shades of gray that we all have to take into account all at once? And, well, if there's an infinite amount of shades of gray, then, of course, you're just saying it's black. But uh, I, whatever. <laughs> 
Which, which is somehow, sometimes how things happen in the public square where, where they, they just go way too far in a certain direction, but they actually are making the black and white issue. In any case, uh, people are getting, some can get offended that we say, well, no, Jesus Christ is the only way that we actually have salvation. And usually it, when we talk to people, usually when we talk to people, it's not the people who are themselves in another belief system that are getting offended. It's usually those people getting offended on those people's behalf. So if you say, well, Christ is the only path to salvation, well, then some people will be offended saying, like, oh, so you're saying the Buddhists are wrong? Yes. Are you saying the Muslims are wrong? Yes. Hindus? Yes. Shintoists? Yes. Well, they're the religion, then I'll tell you. <laughs> this is the only way. And uh, when, when those people also start exploring those other religions, they don't necessarily realize <clears throat> that since this is a mutually exclusive truth thing, that if we're saying that this is the only way it happens, if that if those people are saying there's a different route to salvation than us, then they're automatically saying that they're wrong, even if they try and to incorporate parts of our belief. Because if you go to say, um, um, somebody who believes in, in Hinduism, well, they might accept Jesus Christ as the son of God. Hind Hindus tend to have Hundreds and hundreds of gods, or at least popular Hinduism has hundreds and hundreds of gods. What's one more? Those are sticking right on there. Like, yeah, sure, I believe in Jesus. But they don't actually believe in Jesus because they don't understand what he's trying to say. Um, oh, I, I think there's a book in my office. I think it's actually a version of Sikhism. But there is uh, one. One guy who was trying to borrow quite heavily from the Bible, I think he was living in the 1800s. So he borrowed quite heavily from Jesus' writings, and he was saying, oh, all this is true, except he was reading like the first half of the sentence and then ignored the second half where Jesus is saying, this is specifically about me and, and nobody else. But he'd be reading the first half of the sentence, and say, yeah, this, this is true for universally for everybody. And that's usually what those types of religions do. If they're trying to incorporate Jesus as the way, they'll try to have that way not be the way of the Christian faith of sanctification, but whatever way that they want it to be. It's probably also one of the reasons why Christianity has been persecuted this uh, this much is that there's never yes. a syncretism of uh, Christianity. Um, it's either yeah. Caesar, Caesar is God, or Caesar is not God. Yeah. And, yeah, because we have examples of that in the Bible itself say with uh, uh, Daniel, where he's in the land of Babylon, and there's, there's a law that was put out, well, you have to uh, bow down to this statue and worship the king. Uh, it's the statue, it's King Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, King Nebuchadnezzar. Or, or if you, or there's another one with King Darius later on, so you have to, you have to spend this month worshiping the king, not, not any other god, and then Daniel's like, nope, I'm going to keep worshiping my god. So in the first episode, it wasn't Daniel specifically, but uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace, and then in the second episode, it was Daniel from the lion's den. So we have examples of that. Christian examples would be when you when there were uh, uh, edicts, <laughs> empire-wide edicts for the Roman Empire, saying, hey, you have to worship all the, the Rome, greco roman gods because uh, we're experiencing trouble right now, so this must mean that we're not worshiping enough gods, so worship more gods, and Christians go no, and then Christians are either thrown into jail or executed. Yeah. The, the, the issue, though, I think is more not, not the um, outright persecution, where, where you have people that come right at us, saying, um, Worship this false god or die. Because usually a decisive statement like that, you get a decisive statement from Christian. Uh, I think our issues, particularly nowadays, is more of a soft syncretism, where it's, well, if you're really loving, then you make a compromise on some of your beliefs. And, and this tends to be more what's going on with the uh, uh, United Church or the various iterations of the United Church. And there's a whole bunch of different variations of the United Church. So I'm not saying all of them are absolutely terrible, but there are some that are, are absolutely terrible, because uh, the United Church was basically a way for 
the Church of England to try and incorporate other Christian groups. So, kind of makes sense. They want they want to make sure that all the Christian groups can come together, different Christian denominations. And sometimes that could be really, really small. So you have um, Anglican Church merging with a slightly different version of the Anglican Church down the road. And then they come together, and then that's the United Church in our neighborhood. But you also get United Churches where the Anglican Church unites with, say, the Methodist or the Baptist or the Alliance or whatever you have. But once those churches start merging, well, then you have United Churches going, well, we're already United Churches for Christendom. Why don't we also unite some of the other religions? And then they invite more people. So, so this is why you have a vast range of United Churches, where it's basically kind of a, a union between a couple Christian denominations, which are pretty close to begin with, to practically unmatched paganism, where you're worshiping everything at the same time. Um, and, that, and that is one of the temptations. Uh, even the other Lutheran church is kind of all in the same route, where you have them trying to acknowledge other religions. So, uh, where, where they're actually going up and, and making bits of public prayer, where they're actually saying things to the effect of, Now, I will pray to the supreme spiritual force, which I believe to be God, but you can pray to whatever you want. So, let's have this. Prayer to this undisclosed force deity entity, maybe. Okay. And, the, and at which point they're basically denying Christ because they're trying to appease everybody, but you can't do it. It's either in Christ or not. Okay. I'll, I'll step down from this a lot. There is a song that was circulating when I was probably in junior high school. Um, and maybe somebody here re remembers this song. Uh, Many are the paths that lead to one God, you know, and, and so it was going on and on. Like there's one God, but there's many, many paths to get there. Yeah. So a well, song. So, so, so that's the oh, sorry, um, mm -hmm. pluralist approach. Yeah. And the pluralist approach is using um, um, not the way. What? Oh, the term blew out of my head. Shoot. But there's um, man, I really wish I didn't. Who's that? That's New Ages. Of, there we go. That's usually the New Ages approach, which was popularized a lot in 1970s, somewhat 80s. It's still hanging around today, not at nearly as popular. People are just going more towards atheism. Uh, but New Ageism was more or less a way to try to take what people liked from Christianity, merge it with some of the Buddhist ideas that were becoming popular in, in North America at the time. And then you could incorporate a, a number of other things. I know that UFOs were pretty big with the New Age movement for a while, and then that fell out. So that they kept the religious aspect of it. But with New Ageism, basically what they try to do is they try to merge a couple different religions. So it's a modern age Gnosticism, Gnosticism being a second century heresy, where they're claiming to have some sort of greater spiritual truth that they've self-discovered, and only if you self-discover it uh, can you uh, actually understand the functions of the universe. But hey, if you self-discover things, it turns out everybody has a completely different understanding of what's actually true. So all the, all the New Agers, even though they're claiming to have all this discovery of truth, are always disagreeing with each other. So what, what do you do in that case? Well, then you just ignore all the differences, <laughs> which is what most of them do. And then you just make an even broader tent, and you're now not actually believing in anything at any point in time. Because uh, you, you're believing in everything. But the people who are more spiritually oriented will try to say, well, there's some sort of spiritual entity out there and we're coming into it. And it's usually them making themselves out to be their own God. So, so they are part of God because they have intelligence and other attributes. And if you're becoming more aware, more knowledgeable, then that's actually you trying to be God. And at which point this is a completely different 
heresy known as pantheism, which was one of the ideas in ancient Greece that I digress. So do um, the Hindus and the Muslims, but do they have a exclusion? Mutually belief, exclusive belief. belief yeah. Um, if, if you're going with the purest forms of them, yes, they will have mutually exclusive truth claims. So, so the claims that they're making won't be um, descriptive of any other religion. Now, that kind of blurs the lines with Hinduism and Buddhism because they're coming from the same angle, more or less. Uh, Buddhism is actually just more of uh, an atheistic Hinduism. Really? Yeah. Because within Buddhism, all you have, or what you're trying to go for is nirvana, which is the cessation of self. So you're blending into the universe. Uh, I use that term very broadly. Mm -hmm. But you're trying to remove yourself so everything can become one again. Because individualism, don't you know, that's the devil. That's why you're feeling all this horror and pain and other stuff. It's because you desire uh, things for yourself. Whereas if you just destroy desire, destroy your yourself, your individuality as a human being, well, then that allows you to just morph back into all things. So, so it is very much um, a atheistic understanding at its core where you're just trying to get back to a position where everything is now molded into one big chaos and that, that was originally in creation to begin. But Buddhism over time has complicated things with the various Buddha. Because once you obtain the enlightenment and to come into Nirvana, you will now you're a Buddha. But the Buddha don't necessarily, and this depends on which version of Buddhism you're going to, but the Buddha don't necessarily uh, annihilate themselves, so they're still saying, well, I want to help out, help all the other people reach nirvana. So then you basically have the individual Buddha or Buddhisattvas. Buddhisattvas are the ones who come specifically back in the flesh. Well, now they're all um, acting the part of gods, which is why if you go into a Buddhist temple, you will be seeing gigantic golden statues of Buddha that people are praying to because they want Buddha to solve their problems for them. But, annihilate suffering in their lives and get bring into enlightenment. So Buddhism at its core is supposed to be atheistic, but it's very much morphed into a polytheistic religion because this is just how people are wired. We're wired to actually worship a god. Whereas, and, and Hinduism, Hinduism, uh, there's always the question of um, one god versus many in what it's sometimes understood to be the purest form or the more philosophical form of Buddha, uh, Hinduism, I mean. Uh, you're trying to go back to the one. So all the all the gods, all the individuals, they're trying to morph back into one. And this would be uh, Brahma, or the Brahma principle anyways, where Brahma is the supreme reality of existence, which has a personification as the god Brahma, and then also uh, Shiva and Vishnu for kind of a Trinitarian understanding of things. But you're still trying to get back to, to Brahma. So you're still kind of annihilating yourself in, in terms of meditation, just creasing yourself as an individual, but not to the same degree necessarily as Buddhism. But there's a whole bunch of different types of Hinduism, a whole bunch of different types of Buddhism. If you think Christianity is complicated, try imagining Christianity where people don't read any singular uh, uh, sacred text. So you could go in any direction at any time and you can still claim that you're in that religion. Yeah. Well, I'll make a bigger here. Well, it is bigger as well. Yeah. It's really bigger. So the example that's often given. It's exactly is um, the example of an elephant, and this is this is actually coming from Hinduism. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> tell what it is, so it's good. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but but the example of Hinduism is an elephant, where 
You have a whole bunch of blind men, and they're trying to investigate this. So you have some men that they're, they're feeling the legs, and they're going, "Ah, oh, there, it's a, it's a tree." And then you got some people, and they're you're feeling the ear, and it's like, "Oh, it's a fan." Um, and some people are holding the trunk, and it's like, "Ah, oh, it's a snake." Uh, so they're going all different places on this elephant, and they're feeling different things. And all these blind men are telling you that, telling you what they think that this is, but they're all not right. They only have one path. To the same elephant. So that's usually the example that's given, especially in pop culture now, and it's coming by way of Hinduism, because usually by default people go more the Hindu or the Buddhist way because these incorporate more ideas, because again, people don't necessarily read all the sacred texts that are there, including the sacred texts which contradict each other. So there you can have a whole bunch of different variations. So they're just assuming that all the other religions in the world are just um, younger infantile forms of their true religion at the beginning. Whereas Christianity will come along and go, nope, this is still going to be an elephant when we get to the end, and, it, and there's only one way to this dang elephant. Because there actually is one issue that, uh, that the, most people don't realize when you're coming at trying to formulate an elephant, because they're saying, well, I, I'm feeling this part of this elephant, this part of this elephant, this part of this elephant. But if you're saying it is an elephant, what do you actually have? Or what do you have knowledge of, presumably? An elephant. Yeah, the entire <laughs> elephant. So even though you have these people saying, oh, well, we only have this part here, we only have this part here, with this part here, we're all leading to the same God. Well, now you're just presuming that you've seen the entire elephant. You're presuming that you're the, that everybody else is blind, but you. And fundamentally, that's what people are saying uh, when they're trying to use, well, there's a whole bunch of different paths to God. They're saying, I have greater spiritual revelation than anybody else in any religion in history. That's the claim. Whether or not people realize they're making that claim, they're making that claim. And they'll push back against it once you bring it up. And I brought it up to people. It's like, well, you're claiming that you know more about religion than anybody. Like, no, I don't. Okay, but you're claiming that you know exactly who God is, despite you saying that you don't necessarily even believe in it. So, uh, for for me at that point in the conversation, I'll try to go back to like concrete forms of evidence. At which point, I'll try and reference scripture. But yeah, it, people are saying, well, if there's multiple ways, they're just kind of assuming they know everything already. Whereas they haven't necessarily followed any one of the particular ways individually. So they don't even know if this is right or wrong. Because presumably also, if you have a whole bunch of blind guys trying to find something, you might have the blind guy wander off over here, start feeling a rock, and he's going, oh. At which point they're not even close to the other. So uh, the person who's saying that, yeah, that is an elephant, uh, there is but one God many passed to him, they're already claiming that. They know the act. So rather than rather than us doing that, uh, trying to pretend that we know more than anybody else and previously, we just go all the way to the end and say, oh, well, here's this guy who actually came from the end. This is the guy who came from God himself, and he's showing us the direct way to God. I'm going to trust this guy. Oh, I don't know. I went more in a tangent than I was, but okay, I'm sorry. Truth. Okay. So this was thankfully, whereas this is almost non-existent in, in the Gospel of John, except here in this in this one passage that we're looking at. Truth comes up all over the place in the Gospel of John and in this other right. So this 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 we have a lot of. Okay, but I'll contrast uh, two different types of under understanding of what truth is. I'll, yeah, two different types of understanding what truth is, uh, because this seems to be uh, what John is doing. So he seems to be using both of them. So there is the Greek concept of aletheia. I don't have it written down. 
I want to make sure that I'm spelling this correctly, especially since I'm transliterating this to English. Yes, okay. Aletheia, which is more the, the Greek concept, and John writing in Greek, of course, you would assume that he's meaning it's not at least some of the Greek sense. Um, but he's definitely meaning something more than just the Greek sense. In the Greek sense, this has more of an understanding of uh, revealing. Where there's the truth. The truth is there, but we haven't quite known it or understood it yet. So we have to continuously explore and discover and bring it out. And, and, and this does seem to be somewhat of what Jesus Christ is doing here on earth with the disciples. He's teaching them. He's showing them more of who God is. He, he's giving examples, parables, trying to show some of the hidden meanings that they did not quite understand, even hidden within the very framework of creation and how creation works. And, and this is coming by basically the Holy Spirit. So you have a revelation that's not coming from within you, but from without, that, that you're constantly having this um, getting more and more truthful. Uh, even within the Old Testament concept of creation, where you were having all of creation made, well, that's now substantiating all of what creation is. So Jesus, who has made all that, he is the word, the logos, who was in the beginning, he made all things, he structured all things. So, of course, Jesus is the truth that has made all things. And if we happen to come to the discovery of all things, including the very nature of righteousness, which is not all things, but how all things are ordered, this will be revealed. God is revealing this to us who are unrighteous. We need to have righteousness revealed to us, otherwise we won't get there. So, so we have that aspect, that dimension to it. But um, there's also uh, uh, the Hebrew concept that John also has working at practically the same time, which is a met. And oh, how should I? How should I frame this? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll use. This is kind of a firmness or solidity to things. So truth is that which cannot change, cannot be disturbed, cannot um, break down. So uh, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Of course. So, so there's a real hardness to it that you cannot perturb. Unchangeable? Yeah, immutable. So, so that's more the Hebrew concept of truth, which we see a little bit more so in the Old Testament. But we do see kind of a bit of a revealing as time goes on in the Old Testament, I guess. But the primary concept of truth it will always be more kind of firmness. And this, this is also true, because if we're thinking of, well, Jesus Christ created all things in the beginning, this is the substantiation of reality, all things are ordered that way, this is how all things should be ordered, this is true, well, now we're going to be looking, well, what, what is true? Well, true will be the real mutability, the, the actual facts of what's around us. So even though these things are being kind of revealed to us as we explore, as, as God makes these things open to us, Really, it's still there. It, it, it's unchanging. So from the, this is, um, um, I guess you could say, objective truth, or the understanding of truth objectively, where truth just is. And we are trying to discover it. And then aletheia, at least from John's conception, aletheia, or the revealing, is us pursuing this absolute truth, this, this objective truth. So that's, um, if you will, making truth subjective, not that truth is subjective, not that truth is relying on our individual concepts of what truth is to make it truth, but it is a subjective pursuit of truth, an application of truth, that, that we're receiving truth. Um, one, one of the best ways that I've heard to describe this actually comes from Soren Kierkegaard, uh, a philosopher. He's one of my favorite philosophers. It's also Lutheran, I mentioned uh, Pietist Lutheran, unfortunately, but Lutheran. Uh, what, what, 
in his in his book, uh, concluding unscientific postscript, uh, he's dealing with the issue of the Christian Church in his time, and that and in his day and age, it was the Danish Church, state church, and quite unfortunately, state churches don't necessarily breed faith because they're state owned, state run, state financed. And people are like, oh, well, I'm a citizen of this country, therefore I'm Lutheran, because the Danish church was Lutheran. So they just say, I'm a Lutheran. Okay, when was the last time you went to church? I don't know, when I was baptized. And, and that's kind of what Kierkegaard found in the church of his day. That people did not go to church, they didn't practice the faith, they just normally went for all the festivals, because woo, festivals. And today, we're not really experiencing the same thing in our church. This is an estate church of Canada. We don't have that anymore, even though it used to be the Anglican Church. But if people are, if people want to go to grand festivals or anything, they also don't necessarily go to church anymore. They'll go to uh, stadiums, sporting events. You know, ooh, grand event, ooh, yeah. because people still want that type of excitement, but now they don't have to funnel that through the guise of Christianity. So Kierkegaard, talking against the church in, in his day because it was not facilitating faith or instruction in faith or life in faith. Well, he was talking against a lot of the people who were saying, well, I must be Christian because I was baptized as a baby. And yet, you could ask, have you been to church? Well, once in a blue moon, whenever I wanted to go to this festival. Okay, so do you actually practice the faith? Well, I have promiscuous sex all the time. I steal, I lie now and again, but I'm still, I guess, a Christian because I was baptized. Okay, well, do you even know what baptism is supposed to have done? No, I've just been baptized, therefore that means I'm a Christian. And Kierkegaard's point is, well, you're not actually a Christian because you're not at because you're not in faith. And I would agree with him on it. It's like, yes, you've been baptized, but if you're living in complete unbelief, then you can't you can say you've been baptized, but you can't say that you're a Christian. So Kierkegaard is saying that. Unless this is the, the truth of the faith is the objective truth of the faith is objectively received or subjectively received, subjectively received. You don't have truth. So Kierkegaard makes the statement truth is subjective, and then everybody misunderstands him. <laughs> but he's saying that objective truth is subjectively applied, and if it's not subjectively applied, if it's not given to you, you're not in it. Yes, there is such a thing as Christianity. Yes, there is such a thing as salvation in Jesus Christ. Yes, there is a thing as the promises of baptism. But if you are not living it out, if you don't have it in you, you don't have it. You just don't. Uh, another way you can think about it is with um, the atonement of, or the crucifixion of Jesus. So Jesus Christ died for who? Everybody. Is everybody, is everybody going to be saved? No. No, I'm quite unfortunate. Why not? They don't believe. Because they don't believe. So even though Jesus Christ went to the cross for the forgiveness of those people's sins, it's not being applied to them, which they need to have faith in order to receive it. So truly, these people can't, like everybody can be saved in Jesus Christ our Lord. But we do know the sad truth that not everybody will be because there are still people who reject the objective, real promises of Christ. It's unbelief that damns. Yes. So, uh, to relate this a little bit to what's going on in, in chapter 14 also. Chapter uh, 15 and 16 in, in John. Well, Jesus will start talking about the Holy Spirit. Because yeah. when, it's when he goes to the Father, and we can say that, yeah, he goes to the Father at a cross, his Spirit ascends to the one who gave it. But we can also say that once Jesus ascends bodily in the ascension, so we don't have him walking and talking about us, uh, around us, like he was with the disciples. Yes. Well, still, Jesus is with us. He's still giving us what we need, and that happens to be the Holy Spirit. So even though we don't have Jesus in quite the same way, the Holy Spirit is still bringing us to Christ. So this is this is how the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He's the spirit of Christ, 
and he will lead us into all truth. So even though we might be without Christ in the, in the same bodily sense as he was when he was talking about this with the disciples, the Holy Spirit is still bringing us to Christ and still applying all that Christ has done for us. So we need the Holy Spirit. This is key. And the Holy Spirit is also working in faith within us. Um, the, the sin against the Holy Spirit is the sin of unbelief, the rejection of the promises of God. That's the unforgivable sin. Because you can't receive forgiveness if you don't have faith by the Holy Spirit. But yeah, the Holy Spirit is key to this is because he's always giving us the truth of Jesus Christ by the way of faith. But once you have committed the unforgivable sin, mm -hmm. can you come back from that? Can you still if, if receive? You believe, yes, because um, you, you could theoretically be an unbeliever and come back into the church. And you've seen this before, where okay. people have left the church and they've come back. So we have uh, proof of this. But... If somebody has rejected the promises of Christ, it is a very rare thing for them to actually come back to the church. But right? it's possible. Yeah, yeah, it's possible, but it does. It's um, yeah, it unfortunately does not happen terribly often. Does the Bible indicate that people that believed? And rejected are, are worse off than people that have never been even told or believed. Yeah, so I'll. Jesus says something. I need. The, yeah, Jesus says something. I can't remember that one off the top of my head, but um, Hebrews 10. Let's go with beginning in verse 26. Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 26. So John says, um, oh, sorry, not John. Off of Hebrews. Off of Hebrews says, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know who, for we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So, so the author of Hebrews is basically making the point that in addition to the various other sins that you'd have to answer for on, on the last day, well, now you're also completely desecrating the blood of Christ, which isn't exactly one of the sins that unbelievers would have. Like if, if you're an unbeliever your entire life, well, you never abuse the blood of Christ uh, in your lifetime because you've always rejected it. But the person who was in the faith and rejected it, well, now you're abusing the blood of Christ. He shed his blood for you. He has bought you from your sins. He has given you grace. And now you're saying, yeah, I'm treating God on the cross. God's sacrifice on the cross is worthless to me. So it's a pretty heavy thing. Pretty heavy thing. Now, when you talk about answering these your sins on the last day, mm -hmm. that's pretty scary to me. Yes. Are we not forgiven our sins if we believe in Jesus and ask yes. for forgiveness? But we still have to. Well, we're answering in so far, because uh, there's a whole bunch of passages in the Bible saying that you will be judged by your deeds, and this is going to be true for believers and non-believers. Like, everybody's going to be judged. Um, the good news for us as Christians, though, is, well, who's the judge? Who's the judge? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus on behalf of the Father. Who's also our defense attorney? Jesus. 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 There we go. 
Um, so I don't know how exactly the, the courtroom is going to be set up on the last day, but it's basically going to be Jesus as judge going, well, we have all these counts of sin against you. And then he steps down, goes, goes beside you and say, okay, and I've covered this one and this one and this one. And he goes through the entire list and goes, yeah, all these are covered. And he goes back to his judge stand and says, not guilty. I was kind of how I envisioned something like that. I don't know how it's actually going to work out in practice, but our judge is also our defense attorney, and he's a pretty good one. <laughs> so, yeah, well, anyways, um, oh, right, and um, working prosecution, of course, is Satan, and since Jesus can defend against Satan, that's that's no problem. But for all the people who do not have Jesus as their defense attorney, they have to answer for their sins themselves. Not a good idea. It's not a good decision. Okay. Um, how much time do we have? Yeah. Oh, right. It's a good thing. Um, do you want to try to do? Life before we before we end end for today. We're already over time. We're gonna shortchange it if we try it today, aren't we? <laughs> Maybe. When see, I said we'll shortchange it if we try and rush it. Oh. Maybe. Oh, uh, want to or not? Is life faster than truth? Right. Probably because I'm. Because I'm going into kind of philosophical realms here and there, life not not quite as much. How many more minutes would it take? I don't know. <laughs> I'll say ten. If you can do it in ten, I'm good. Okay, I'll do that. All right. Um, so now we're getting life. And I'll put, I'll bring this all the way over here so we can start up here. Uh, so, got so A. So, so A is kind of the general concept of life, abstract concept of life. So, Jesus is saying, I'm the abstract concept of life. This is still, uh, this is actually present within multiple I am statements. So, we have the I am statement saying, I'm the way, the truth, and life. This is one of the ways that Jesus Christ identifies himself as. And life comes up with three of these things. Huh, huh, number three. I don't know if this is coincidence or not. I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But this is also incorporated within the bread of life. And it's incorporated with being the resurrection in life. So, yeah, life, life is pretty important, especially within the concept of the Gospel of John, because if we're talking about major salvation metaphors, and there's quite a few different salvation metaphors throughout Scripture, um, being in the uh, Western tradition of the church, we as Lutherans usually gravitate more towards uh, the, the legal metaphor, so that would be justification, sanctification, I just had an example of the courtroom on the last day. So that's usually how we frame things. But there's also uh, a whole bunch of different metaphors. There's, say, like adoption metaphors or uh, clothing metaphors, uh, uh, feasting metaphors for, for salvation and, and, uh, and grace. But the other really major one, and this is more so the Eastern Church, so the Western Church more goes for the legal uh, legal metaphor. The Eastern Church, the Orthodox primarily, of course, they go more for the life metaphor. That Jesus Christ is giving you life. So, so when you hear uh, a sermon preached in an Orthodox Church, you probably won't hear as much of uh, you're made righteous, you are justified. You, you, you'll probably hear more. Christ is giving you life. He's poured life into you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Stuff like that. And that's because the Eastern Church 
it's relying a bit more on John, John's writings in the Bible, whereas the Western church is relying a little bit more on Paul's writings in the Bible, and Paul does this a bit more in legal terms. Okay. Clearly, no, life is very important to the Gospel of John. It's come up a couple of weeks before. Jesus is saying in the bread of life, unless you eat my flesh, drink my blood, that you have no life within you. Jesus is saying, I am the resurrection, and I am the life. He who believes in me will not die, and I will raise him up on the last day. I'm oh, sorry. sorry, no. Raising him up on the last day, that's part of the bread of life. That's for us. Sorry. Resurrection and life. Um, he who believes in me will never, although he dies, yet shall he live. And he who believes in me shall never truly die. Okay. But even, even uh, um, beyond this, we see Jesus Christ talking about uh, life and resurrection in John chapter 5, verse 25 to 29. So this is also where Jesus Christ is making a bit of a courtroom procedure, where he's talking about how there's the resurrection to life, so through his word you come from death to life, and then on the last day your, your body will be raised from death possibly to life. There will be judgment for both the, the, the righteous and the unrighteous. But those who are righteous will go on to eternal life. Those who are unrighteous, no. Um, so, so this has been one of the main things that Jesus has been talking about thus far in the Gospel of John. In fact, Jesus is also defined by life elsewhere. Truth and, and the way, again, way only comes up at certain times. Jesus doesn't really identify himself as truth in different locations. But both truth and life come up and be roll off to John. So, so this is these are a couple of the main things of John is truth and life. And let's see, uh, John chapter one verse four, he is the true light which has come into the world, who has brought life to all men. So Jesus is truth, life, and this is the source of. Oh, the true light, which is also light, and this is the source of all light for, for human beings. So it's fundamentally what makes creation creation. So you also see that these things are kind of tied together in different locations in the Gospel of John. So, you, so if you're coming into life, you're coming into truth. If you're coming into truth, then you will have life because this is drawing you to Christ himself. So this also kind of implies that this is also connected together. How is a little bit more difficult. But it, but it should be there. It should be there. Oh, and that's on uh, the next verse. Okay. Verse, verse 7, which I haven't gone to. Okay. So life. Oh, shoot. Um, I, I had something else. I had something else. Right. Okay. So now these things come back, combined, combined. What, what are we actually looking towards? Well, Jesus is talking about uh, coming to the Father. That's verse seven. I'll probably get to that uh, in a future week. But with just these, well, what is Jesus Christ truly trying to say? Well, this is him actually pointing to the cross and the resurrection. Uh, it's actually most clear when we get to the subject of truth. Um, on Good Friday, uh, you might remember truth coming up at one point. This is when Jesus is saying, my kingdom is not of this world. And for this reason, I came into the world. And all those who listen to the truth, listen to me. And then Pilate says, or do you remember what Pilate says? What is truth? Yeah. Okay. And then I read another chapter and a quarter. I'm, I'm going to guess you don't remember the entirety of it, but I, I'm going to let you guess. Did truth come up in that in the next chapter in court? No. No, the subject of truth did not come up in the chapter in court. And I'll also say in chapters 20 and 21, finishing out the Gospel of John, the word truth does not come up. The last time truth as, as word comes up is Pilate's statement. The implication is that when Pilate says, what is truth, and Jesus doesn't speak to him anymore, Jesus is now showing him what truth is. So the truth 
is Jesus going to the cross for forgiveness of sins and our resurrection. That is true. That is the gospel. And it's something that, again, it has to be revealed. It has, it has to come into creation, but it's still kind of set into the firmness of reality that this is how God is going to save all of creation. This is this is what was fulfilling all the scriptures that came way before. This is, this is what will determine the the uh, essence of, of reality afterwards. So um, the truth is solidified by Jesus Christ at the cross and the empty grave. At which point, the cross and the empty grave is also the source of life for us. Because if Jesus Christ is giving us life, it can only be by him laying down his life for us, giving us his love that we may live in this. So if we're in Christ, we're receiving his life, and his life is what wins us our salvation. And if we're also thinking about way, and Jesus is saying, I will show you to the way to the Father, you'll come to the Father, I'm preparing a place for you with the Father. Well, then the way is also prepared by what Christ did at the cross and the resurrection by Jesus Christ going to the Father, preparing the place, and coming back to bring us all into that place of salvation. So all these things, they're meant to basically specifically tie into what's about to occur. Crucifixion, resurrection. Primarily crucifixion, but resurrection is kind of in there. Questions, comments, confusions? I have a, something that just popped into my head to ask as a question. Doesn't really probably connect with this, but I was thinking at the resurrection, mm -hmm. when when everyone is raised, that the dead in Christ will be raised first. Well, they will have uh, glorified bodies. What about the unbelievers? When they are raised, they're not going to have glorified bodies, are they? Of course or do not. we even, we don't know. They're, but, they're, they're not, because because there's the general resurrection. Yeah. And the general resurrection is where everybody's raised. And as you said, the, the dead in Christ will rise first. This is us uh, being raised at the sound of the trumpet, but at the call of uh, an archangel. And as it says in First Thessalonians chapter 4. And then the dead in Christ will rise first and meet Christ. So as he descends, we're meeting him on the way. Um, you can also see kind of the flip, not a flip version, but a, a, an alternate perspective on it in the gospel accounts where Jesus Christ is saying the son of man, you will see the son of man coming with power on the clouds and he will send out his angels and he will gather everybody to himself. So so that's a, that's a different perspective on the same thing. It's that we're all being raised to meet meet our Lord as he said. So we're the ones who are uh, in in his power and glory or at least reflecting in it. But the dead in the dead not in Christ, they don't have this power and glory. They're now they're facing judgment. So part of the being clothed with uh, uh righteous being clothed with new bodies as well uh, with immortality which is what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he's saying uh, we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Uh, the immortality that we're placing on is Christ immortality specifically. The other, those who are not in Christ, they don't have that. So they're not changed. We're changed, they're not changed. Yeah. They're, they're, they're still in uh, mortal flesh and coming into the second death. We're not. Thanks. Yep. All right. Let us close with prayer. Can we pray for Paul too? Okay. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for bringing us together this 100th uh, study of the Gospel of John. We ask you to, the Lord, to look after us as we continue to study, continue to have more of your truth revealed by way of the scriptures of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask you that this sustains us in body and soul to life everlasting. We ask you, O Lord, also to be with 
uh, our brother Paul as he suffers in his body, uh, that you give him strength to bear his infirmity, that you give him uh, healing of the flesh and uh, medical personnel who are able to find the problem and help him uh, with his illness at this time. Let me ask that uh, uh, you guide Paul according to your will, as well as all those who are also sick and infirm. We ask the Lord to look after and care for them, uh, that uh, they may serve you according to your will, that we all might come into your kingdom uh, forgiven and renewed on the last day. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.